believing God for the impossible. Poke your neighbor and say, believe for it. Um, belief has everything to do with what we receive from God. God gave me a prophetic word today. Uh, this is not your run-of-the-mill message. This is a prophetic word. It's in two parts. One is the problem. The second one is the answer. And you're going to like that when I get to the answer part. Because what God's about to do in your life this year, God has spoken to me. And he's called this the year of restoration. And that's what I've named uh, the title of this message. I'm telling you, this is, this is the year of restoration. If you'll believe, you're going to see God do incredible things. So I'd like to open with Joel chapter 2. I don't normally put messages together like this. Just, just hang with me. We're going to be all in the book of Joel today. But I've got to paint a picture of what the problem was and what God did and what God's going to do for you this year. Joel chapter 2, verse 18 through 27. Then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. The Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I will send you grain and new wine and oil. Man, praise God. And you will be satisfied by them. I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations. But I will remove far from you the northern army. And will drive him away into a barren and desolate land. With his face toward the eastern sea and his back toward the western sea. His stench will come up and his foul odor will rise because he has done monstrous things. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice for the Lord has done marvelous things. Whew. Do not be afraid, you beast of the field, for the open pastures are springing up. And the tree bears its fruit, the fig tree and the vine yield their strength. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. That's six months worth of rain in one month. That's six time return. That's six times repayment. And that's what I felt like the Lord put in me. That everyone who will believe God and go after him this year, he's going to give you a six times return. For everything that's been stolen and done to you. Glory to his name. The threshing floor shall be full of wheat and the vat shall overflow with new wine and oil. So I will restore to you, watch this, not the minutes, not the months or days, the years that the swarming locust has eaten. That means what's, what the enemy has taken years to destroy from your life, God said, I'll do it in 30 days. The crawling locust, the consuming locust, the chewing locust, my great army which I sent among you. Notice it was God that sent the problem because they had abandoned him. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be put to shame. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and I am the Lord your God and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. What God is saying, and you'll hear this at the end of the message, the shame and humiliation of the mess that you've made of your life, God says, I'll take that away. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this word, and I know it's a prophetic word for this house, for this hour, and for these wonderful people. God, I just pray you would anoint me to speak forth your word, not in word and tongue only, but also in power and in deed. Let this seed fall in the good soil of our hearts and grow and bear forth fruit in our lives. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. Hold your Bible up, whatever form you have, and let's boldly declare, Father, today, this week, by your grace. I'm going to be a doer of your word and not a hearer only, deceiving my own self. Now, Lord, anoint my ears, anoint my heart, anoint my spirit, my soul, my mind, and my body to receive the truth of your word. In Christ's name I pray. Amen, amen. High five somebody near you and say, this is my year of restoration. Come on, poke somebody else and say, this is your year of restoration. It was known as the miracle on the Hudson. They made a movie about it. 
the plane that took off in New York, LaGuardia, and birds hit it and went down. The pilot masterfully landed it in the Hudson River. All passengers got out. I can't remember the exact count. On the wings, ran for their lives. No one died. No one really injured. Everyone saved. The pilot was, was a miracle. But nobody thought about was all their belongings. Nobody trying to get off the plane was worried about their backpack or their luggage. One lady, one lady only on her way out said, Oh, what about my purse and 18E? But she, you know, come off on the wing. Nobody was really concerned about their things. They got water law. They got this, that, and the other. What is amazing about this story that you'll never hear, you'd have to research it, is that a company that specializes in restoration in Texas got every single thing those people owned, completely restored it to its original condition, and gave it all back to them, totally and completely restored. Not only were they saved, their belongings were totally restored. And God sent me by to tell some of you that you think some of your life is so messed up it can't be put back together. And some of you are even thinking, I have blown years of my life. I've wasted them. I was away from God or I did stupid things or I was with the wrong person or whatever it is. And you're bought into the lie. The devil's tried to make you think there's no way your marriage can be fixed. There's no way your life can be put back together. Yes, you can get out on the wing and you can be saved. But you're thinking in your mind, oh, there's no way God can restore every area of my life. And I've come by to tell you that God says, I will restore every single thing in your life. Joel was likely written between 535 and 500 B.C. And at this time in history, listen, Israel was a mess. Let me just tell you about the problem. An appalling famine was caused by an awful plague of locusts. You're going to learn some stuff about locusts today. You probably never wanted to, but I got to do that to get you where I'm going. It was followed by a prolonged drought. So the locusts ate everything. There was no rain. Nothing was growing. The cattle and the people were starving to death. It devastated the land. And that leads me to point number one. The devil had stolen from them. Point number one is this. Has the devil stolen from you? Has the devil taken anything from you? The land of Israel had just suffered a terrible plague of locusts and they devoured every green thing. Nothing was living. They left nothing but desolation. They were a judgment sent by God because of the sins of his people. He called them to repent. They wouldn't do it. So he sent the locusts to devour every living thing, hoping to draw them back to himself. An army of locusts is truly an incredible thing. I, I just want you, I want you to see a picture. You're going to see a picture today. Joel chapter 2 verse 2 says, A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, like dawn spreading across the mountains. A large and mighty army comes, such as never was in ancient times, nor ever will be in ages to come. There was never a locust infestation in the world history like it was then. Swarms of locusts can literally fill the air and block the sky and the sun like a solar eclipse, history will record. Joel 2.5 says, with a noise... Like that of chariots, they leap over the mountaintops like a cracking fire, crackling fire, consuming stubble, like a mighty army drawn up for battle. Their flight can be heard for miles and miles away, and it sounds like a roaring fire coming at you. I'm talking about millions and millions of locusts that fly. They sound like a fleet of approaching helicopters. Joel chapter 2 and verse 3 it says, before them fire devours, behind them a fire blazes. Before them the land is like the Garden of Eden, behind them a desert waste. Nothing escapes them. The land in which the locusts pass looks as if it's been swept by fire. Totally and completely for many, many square miles blackened and totally destroyed. They weigh millions of tons of pounds altogether. They consume Every living green thing or plant in its path. Armies of these insects advance. They destroy everything green in a few minutes. Just a few minutes. Every leaf, every blade of grass, everything is gone. They consume. And I perceive that maybe in some of your lives the enemy has sent some consuming spiritual locusts to steal from you health 
and finances and your children. And it seems like everywhere you turn, your life's being consumed by the enemy or has been. In just a few minutes, they'll obliterate a year's worth of income and leave no hope for harvest. In fact, in verse 5 and 6, they're declared that they'll even eat the bark off the trees. They'll eat everything in sight. They can appear overnight and be gone the following day and leave nothing but destruction in its path. The most recent locust infestation on the earth was in February 2020 in eastern Africa when they consumed everything and destroyed every crop in its path. They can travel hundreds of miles with a strong wind. Hundreds of miles with a strong wind. And have no destination in sight. They just, wherever they land, they consume it, destroy it, it's gone. That's what the enemy tries to do in our lives. They're locusts. The plague dreaded more than by any other than ancient farmers. In the Old Testament, a, a locust infestation or invasion was a death sentence for a crop, and many times the people, they had nothing to eat following. The sound of locust wings overheard is dreadful. People would dig trenches. They would light trees on fire to hopefully get them away. They would beat the locusts, and they would stomp them and kill thousands to no avail. There's millions and millions. They can darken the sky. There's so many. God warned his people this could happen if they abandoned him and sinned against him. Deuteronomy 28, 38. You will sow much seed in the field, but you will harvest little because locusts will devour it. But God is saying, if you walk away from me and you turn to a sinful life, you should expect some locusts to come and do some damage. And it's sent many times by the enemy, but God will allow it because God wants you to turn back to him. Joe declared the locusts were a judgment from God and called the people in Judah to repent. Listen to how he graphically describes the plague. Joel 1, 2, hear this, you elders, listen, all you, all who live in the land. Has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of your ancestors? He is calling on the older men of his generation, and Joel is, and he's saying, hey, have you ever seen anything like this in your lifetime? Confirm this. They're going, well, have you never seen anything like this? Joel 1, 5, <laughs> I think this is funny. Wake up, you drunkards, and weep. Wail, all you drinkers of wine, wail because of the new wine, for it has been snatched from your lips. They ate all the vineyards. Everybody wanted to get drunk, couldn't get drunk. You talking about a problem in society, take the alcohol out, we're going to have a problem. The old men said they'd never seen anything like it. They couldn't even drink anything. Verse 9, Joel 1, grain offerings and drink offerings are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests are in mourning who minister before the Lord. The priests couldn't go to the house of God and offer any meat offerings, grain offerings, or drink offerings. They didn't have anything to offer. There's no sacrifice going on. There's no prayer going on. I mean, this is a mess. This is, this is a problem. Joel 1.20, even the wild animals pant for you. The streams of water have dried up and fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. Even the cattle and the sheep in the fields were suffering. Everything living was suffering at this time in Israel. The land had been devastated by locusts. would take years to recover. Think of, uh, think of a hurricane down in the south. And how it devastates and it takes years to recover the land. Or fire out in the Yellowstone and it takes years and years to recover. The locusts, it's even exponentially greater. In fact, Joel said in verse 16 of chapter 1, Has not the food been cut off before our very eyes? Joy and gladness from the house of our God. He told them, I want you to think about what's caused this calamity. The priest led in a repentance campaign by the prophetic word of Joel, Joel 1, 13 and 14. Put on sackcloth, sackcloth, you priest, and mourn. Well, you who minister before the altar, come spend the night in sackcloth, you who minister before my God. For the grain offerings and drink offerings are withheld from the house of your God. Declare a holy fast 
Call a sacred assembly. Summon the elders and all who live in the land in the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. It was an event to come back to God. God rose up a prophet in Joel. He gathered the priests and he said, we got to get back to God. We got nothing. We're all going to die. The land is barren. Everything has gone to pot. It sounds like that's where we're heading in America. And they said, we need to get back to an old-fashioned altar. We need to repent before God, and we need to pray. And I don't know about you, but there's been some repentance in my life over this past week that's part of the fasting and the praying. Is God, get my heart right with you. Let my motives be right. Let my thoughts be right. Somebody say a good amen. And in Joel, there's a lesson for us today. I believe not in the world, but I believe the church in America is in a very dangerous and desolate condition. When churches no longer want to speak the truth, but only part of the Bible. When they only want to tickle ears and tell you you're going to drive Mercedes Benz and live in mansions. There's a problem. I want to tell you we got to get back to God in America again. It has been laid waste by many spiritual locusts. While we don't suffer in America right now from a physical locust eating every green thing, there is the spiritual locust, demons if you will, evil spirits that are moving upon this earth and they're wiping out everything in sight. They're creating divisions. They're creating confusion in people. People don't know if they're boys or girls anymore. Where do you think that comes from? The devil. They're creating all kinds of divisions everywhere you look, race and culture and all that. I want to tell you, I believe God can raise up a church to bring people back together. Amen. Of every nation, culture, creed, color. Somebody say amen. Spiritual drought and famine is on all sides. I believe we're in a famine for the word of God in this nation. I really believe it. People aren't preaching the word anymore. People aren't declaring what God says anymore. The call goes out today for us to go into true heartfelt repentance. When's the last time you shed tears over your sin? When's the last time you said, God, get this seed of sin out of my spirit, God? Lord, when's the last time you came to an old-fashioned altar, whether it be at the church or in the altar of your home, and said, God, I don't want to sin before you anymore? God promised them if they would repent, he would turn things around. And he promises us the same thing today. Let me remind you of the famous scripture, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray. That speaks to fasting and pray. Then I will hear from heaven. I will heal their land. And I forgot the rest. What is it? And forgive their sins, heal their land. And what are you going to know? My brain ain't been working right. I'm tired. You get six days into this thing, your mind don't think right. That's where we were. That's where the children of Joel were, or Israel, when the time of Joel. The priests led the nation in a prayer of repentance. They came before God. They humbled themselves. They got right with God. Now let me show you what happens on the second half. Because this is where God is sending a prophetic word to us. Point number two, God will restore what's been stolen from you. Oh, I'm going somewhere. <laughs> you don't know where I'm going, but I know where I'm going. Joel 2.25, so I will, does God lie? I will restore to you, everybody say the years. There's some of you, you feel like, I say it again. You feel like, man, I, I, I blew 10 years. I blew 5 years. I blew 13 years. I, I just blew 15 years. I blew 20 years. God can restore it. How does he do that? Listen, God promised he would reverse the effects of the judgment. He said he would restore the years the locusts have eaten. Can you believe for that? You see, you don't understand how bad my marriage has been the last 5 years. No, but God can restore how does that happen? Look, the definition of restore here in the original Hebrew means to be complete. It means to be sound, to be finished, to be ended, to be uninjured, to make whole or good, 
make compensation, repay. God says, I'll tell you what, Bridge of Hope. If you'll come before me and you'll truly repent of your sins and walk in my ways, I'll repay you everything the devil has ever stole from years back. Notice that the restoration follows repentance first. Only a sovereign, eternal God, one who is all-powerful, can restore lost days, lost months, and lost years. Woo. No one can ever go back and reclaim squandered time or squandered choices. But God, however, can take the time we do have, multiply it, so that you're repaid what was stolen and taken from you. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying? God said, I'll send the former and the latter rain. I know you've been in a drought, Bridge of Hope. I know you've been in a drought, sir or ma'am. But I want to tell you, what the devil stole over six months, I'll return in 30 days. I'll do what never happens in the natural. I'll cause the former rain, and I'll cause the latter rain. Glory to God. I've been praying, God, what the devil has stole from our church body. He has. He has stole and ransacked us and messed with us. And I say, you know what, God? Uh, this is the year of restoration. God, I've been here 11 years. Why don't you take 11 years worth of ministry that we could have been doing and do it in one? Would it be all right with you if God multiplied what would normally take a church 11 years and does it in one? What if God took 11 years of your mess and said, I'll restore it and repay it in one? Glory to God. Woo. God can restore your life. Can you believe for it? All the sin and mess you created, God can wipe it out and totally restore you and make you brand new today. The despair and hopelessness can change. And God can restore hope and faith back in your spirit in the twinkling of an I can do it right now. The addiction, the stronghold, the bondage can be broken and your life restored instantly. The sickness and disease that has racked your body can be healed and your health restored immediately. That wrecked relationship or marriage can be restored right now. God specializes in taking our broken, beat down, and destroyed lives and restoring us. The question for you and I today is, can you believe God for that? Can you believe for God to restore your life in every way? God sent me to tell you this is the year of restoration. I want to point out five things that Joel said God was going to restore. And they're the five things God's going to restore in your life this year if you'll believe. You ready? Joel 2.19, the Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I will send you grain and new wine and oil. God said, I'm going to restore to Israel their material prosperity and their sustenance. All the farms and vineyards of the nation are going to start growing again. They're going to be healed, and they're going to produce enough crops to satisfy every person. First thing God told me and in the scriptures and God wanted me to convey to you is, God will restore your material prosperity if you'll repent and turn to him. Can you believe that? God wants to take you from lack, from not enough, to not just barely enough, but to more than enough. God wants to restore your finances and your material resources to the point that you can not just have what you need, but you can be a blessing to others to win other people to Jesus. Man, somebody shout amen. Do you believe? Can you believe God for it? Somebody shout amen. If you'll repent and return the tithe to God, God says, I'll bless you. Malachi 3, 8 and 10 says that if there's anything you can test them in, it's that. He said, bring the tithes to the storehouse and prove me now herewith if I will not watch this. Open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you can't receive it. That's overabundance. Would it be all right with you if God poured out an overabundance into your life? I've been praying all week and for a while now. God released promotions to our people. Released pay raises to our people. Released bonuses and gifts to our people. They don't don't even know it's coming. Bless the people of Bridge of Hope so they can be a blessing around here to win people to Jesus. 
Malachi or Matthew 23 and 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law. Justice and mercy and faith. These ought you to have done, watch this, without leaving the others tithing undone. Notice that you will never see the Bible say give tithes. You can't give somebody what's theirs. The tithe belongs to God. He said, you pay it. It belongs to God. Gee, listen, if this was the only scripture in the Bible that declared we're to tithe, I would do it because the, the God who died for me on the cross, Jesus, said I ought to. That's good enough for me. If you'll honor God and repent of taking God's tithes and start writing tithes checks out, you watch what God will do with your finances. Number two, Joel 2.19, the second half of that verse. And you will be satisfied by them. I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations. God said, I'm going to restore respect and honor to these people. Never again, listen, he said, never again would this particular group of people be humiliated, scorned, or ridiculed among all the peoples of the earth. He said, I'm going to repay and restore your life so much people will only be able to look at you and say, wow, there must be a God. God wants to take away, listen, I, boy, I feel this. God wants to take away the shame and the humiliation of your past. Some of you have been carrying shame around. You're ashamed of the things you've done. You're ashamed of the things you've been a part of and thought and experienced. And the devil's beat you up. You come in here to worship God. You throw your hands up. And even today, I feel like the Lord is telling me that some of you go to throw your hands up. The devil said, oh, look what you do. You're gonna, now you're going to, you hypocrite. Now you're going to throw your hands and worship God. Oh, look what you did. Look what you did. Look what you did. Listen, don't, listen. You, you know what? You know what? Yeah, I did that. Thank you for reminding me, devil, of the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you for reminding me of all I've been forgiven of. Thank you for reminding me how good Jesus is. Oh, the blood. See, I'm telling you, he'll leave you alone after just a second. He, won't, he don't want to hear about all the blood. And then you start thinking, you know what? I thank you for reminding me, devil, of where I was and where I am now because of Jesus. I want to thank you that I'm on my way to heaven. And while I'm thinking about it, I'm going to heaven and you're going to burn in the lake of fire, devil. You're going to hell. So I want to tell you, I may have had some shame, but you're the one that's going to burn. I've been forgiven by the grace of Jesus Christ. Woo! God says, I'm going to restore your honor. Oh, you need to hear this. Some of you are even hearing me, you're thinking, honor, what honor? I haven't had honor in ever. God says, I'm going to restore honor to your life. Do you understand the power behind that? You'll turn to him with everything you got. He says, I'll restore honor and respect to your life, people will honor you. Man, there's something about being honored. Jesus nailed our sins and our shame and humiliation to that cross. Listen, God wants to restore your honor, your respect, your dignity. Can you believe God for that? Verse 20, Joel 2 says, But I will remove far from you the northern army, and will drive him away into a barren and desolate land with his face toward the eastern sea and his back toward the western sea. His stench will come up and his foul odor will rise because he has done monstrous things. There are two things God says I'm going to restore to the nation of Israel and ultimately us today. He said I'm going to deal with this army so you're going to have peace. God said I'm going to, I'm going to restore peace to your life and national security. When the northern army attacked the Jews, the Lord himself would defeat the enemy. God wants to restore peace to you. You don't have to go to bed in anxiety anymore. You don't have to go to bed fearful anymore, holding the covers, shaking every little noise in the house. You don't have to get up in the morning on your way to work terrified of what the day is going to bring. God says, I'll restore peace to your life. Such peace you'll sleep before the presence of your enemies. Such peace that you will no longer think about what could happen in a wrong way, but now you'll believe God expecting for the good things to happen. How many of you, would it be all right if God poured out some peace into your life? He said in Philippians 4, 6 through 7, uh, that, that, that he's the God of peace. 
And he wants to give us peace that passes all understanding. And the peace of God, watch this, will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. He promised in John 14, 27, My peace I give to you, Jesus said, Not as the world gives, but as I give. Let not your heart be troubled. Would it be all right with you if God restored some peace to your life? Somebody here think, Oh, man, I'm nervous all the time. God will take all that out. God's also willing to fight your battles if you'll let him. He said, I'll shift the locusts out of here. I'll get rid of the northern army. I'll be your defense. I want to tell you, God is our rear guard, our front guard, our side guards. He's under us. He's over us. He's all around us. Man, I'm telling you, you're covered in the blood of Jesus. You got angels surrounding you. I'm preaching to somebody. God's got you on the inside and the outside, in the city and in the country. God's got you coming, and he's got you going. Man, I've come to tell somebody, God's going to restore to you that he is your defense. Woo! Yeah. We used to sing a song here not too long ago. God is fighting for us, pushing back the darkness. And I don't know the rest, so I won't sing anymore. But you remember the song. I want to tell you, God is fighting for you. He says, if you'll repent and you'll turn back to me, I'll restore my protection over you. I'll flood down peace in your life. I'll flood down material blessing in your life. Man, is anybody in on this? He said, I got you from the head up to the tail down. Somebody say amen. amen. It don't stop there. It gets gooder and gooder. Joel 2, 21 and 22, Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done wondrous things. Do not be afraid, your hearts of the field, for the open pastures are springing up. Whoo, I feel spring in the air. Maybe not in the physical right now, but in the spiritual, you better believe I do. And the tree bears its fruit again, he's saying. I, I put it again in there, but he bears the fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield its strength. God said, you know what? I'm going to heal the land itself. You know what he said in 2 Chronicles 7? I'll forgive your sin and heal your land. The land would now produce more than enough fruit and sustenance for them. Listen, God, God wants to restore your fruitfulness. Can you believe God for it? John 15, 5, and then again in verse 16, he said he wants you to bear much fruit. And bear fruit and fruit that remains. No more spinning your wheels and nothing happening. Bridge of Hope, what he's saying to us today, no more praying your guts out and nothing happening. No more worshiping when everything you got is serving with everything you got and nothing really happening. No more going out and doing outreach and nobody showing up. No more doing everything you got. He said, ah, I'm going to restore to you the years the locusts have eaten. And every person that rejected you, he's going to send one in their place. And he's going to do it very fast and very quickly. You get ready, Bridge of Hope. He says, no more just praying and praying and praying and nothing happening. Now, he says, I am going to send them in. And they shall get saved. And they will be delivered. And they will be filled with my spirit. And their lives will be changed and delivered. Their families will break forth and to worship and praise. They will seek me and I will bless them, says the Lord of hosts. Glory to God, that was prophetic right there. This is a year of growth and fruitfulness for you. This is a year of growth and fruitfulness for our church. Can you believe it? Woo! Verse 23. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you. The former rain and the latter rain in the first month. God said, I'm going to restore good weather to the children of Israel. Now, what, what does that mean? He's, rain was, water was everything to them. They're an agricultural society. They needed water to grow crops, for animals to sustain, for life. God's saying with this statement, there'll no longer be famine and there'll no longer be drought. An abundance of rain, both spring and fall, will come down from the sky and water the earth. He promised six months of rain in 30 days, sixfold. Would it be all right with you if God rained down six months worth of blessings, health, restoration in every area of your life in 30 days? 
Amen. I'll, I'll take some. What would normally take years to recover from, God said, I'm going to do it this year. I, I, I tell you what, God said he'll restore the reign of the Holy Spirit in your life. Can you believe for it? Mom, I'm going to preach a little bit about verse 28 and 29 next week. Listen, God says, I'm going to pour out the Spirit of God in your life. You know what he's saying to us today? He's saying the drought that you've been in spiritually, I'm going to flood you with my Spirit. The river of the Holy Spirit's going to flow. The wind of the Holy Spirit's going to blow. The fire of the Holy Spirit's going to burn. The oil of the Holy Spirit's going to heal and soothe. The peace of the Holy Spirit's going to calm you down. He's saying, I want to tell you something. Some of you been in a dead, dry place. You've tried to worship, feel nothing. You've tried to pray and read your Bible, you got nothing. It's brass heavens, it's black and white on a page. God says, this is the year when you open your Bible, the words are going to jump into your spirit. This is the year when you open your mouth to pray, His Spirit is going to flood down on you. When you worship, you're going to be in the glory of God in the presence of His holy angels in His throne room. We go boldly to the throne of God. Man, I'm preaching to somebody. God says the drought is over. Woo! Somebody shout amen. Can you believe it? God says I want to restore the dry and barren places of your life. Verse 24 and 26, Joel 2. The threshing floors will be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. So I'll restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust. My great army, which I sent among you, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be put to shame. God said, I'm going to restore the people's food supplies in the Old Testament. Storage facilities, distribution centers would be filled with food. The threshing floors would be filled with grain and vats overflowing with new wine. In fact, the years of production lost due to the invasion of locusts would be repaid in full. Bridge of Hope, the years out on the road that the devil stole from us. God says, I'm going to repay it all back this year. Whew. Never again would the people go hungry. They would always have plenty to eat. God restores your resources. Can you believe for it? God wants to lead you to a place of plenty. Can you believe for it? Psalm 37, 25, I've been young and now I'm old, yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. God wants to take you to a place where your depleted bank accounts are restored to an overabundance. Can you believe for it? Watch this and I'm done. The locust attacks were not actually done in a single year. If you study this, it was continuous. This was a continuous problem. But God said the bad years would be compensated by an especially good year. Pastor, you brave preaching this. No, I'm not. I know I've heard from God. Pastor, you don't know what the economists are predicting for 2024. Here's what the Lord put on me about that. God is going to protect his people and 2024 will not have any effect on his children. You're going to be defended and immune from it. God wants to take everything the devil stole from you and restore it all back this year. Can you believe God for it? Get ready, Amber. God's going to pay you back everything that was stolen from you these past years. Church, I've done my best to tell you this is not just a regular message. This is a prophetic word. But you have to believe it and receive it. 
I, I, here's what I, I want you to do. I, just any, I don't know how else to say it. But if you believe and receive it, can you just come find a spot at this altar and just say, first of all, repent. Repent of any known sin that you have. Totally lay your life down at this altar before him. If you can't physically get down on your hands and knees, then make the front benches, the chairs, the, the prayer place. But after you repent, I want you just to declare, God, I receive your word. God, I receive it. I receive restoration. I receive restoration in my health. I receive restoration in my material possessions. I, I receive restoration of healing my land. I receive restoration of the outpouring of the, of the rain of the Holy Spirit. No more droughts, no more famines. I receive you taking what normal, what has been years stolen and wrecked. And it could be your fault and that's okay. When you repent, God still will restore. The children of Israel was their fault. But God said, I'm still going to, if you'll turn back to me. I will restore the years that have been stolen. Years of relationship issues, maybe with your children or grandchildren. God says, if you will turn to me this year, I'll restore that broken relationship with your son or daughter or grandchild or parent. I will totally restore just like the property on that Hudson on the Miracle Plain. It will be restored to you in the condition in which it left. Only God can do something like this. Come on, church, it's time to pray. Come on, find a spot. You can put a little Spotify if you want, but I'm telling you, this is a word, a prophetic word for the hour. I receive it, Lord, myself.